sandy beaches, flamenco, and world-famous buildings like the Alhambra. This is but one side of Spain, for the country on the Iberian Peninsula has so much more to offer. An abundant wildlife full of surprises and spectacular wonders of nature. From the depths of the ocean to deep into the interior. From the swelteringly hot south to the green north and its rugged mountain world. It's almost impossible to find a larger biodiversity anywhere else in Europe. Between Galicia and the Basque Country lies a completely different and unknown Spain. Seas of clouds surge against the Cantabrian mountains in the north of Spain. Humid air masses from the Atlantic accumulate along the almost 500-kilometer-long rock barrier. This is why northern Spain is not always blessed with sunshine, but rather with another, no lesser important property. The region thanks its lush green vegetation to the frequent precipitation. The weather holds no sway over the animals, and rain is certainly no reason to stop a good romp. This brown bear mother keeps a watchful eye on her young. She is aware that danger lurks everywhere. She raises her offspring completely alone. The males live solitary lives. Should the male bear discover the young, he would probably kill them to be able to pair with the mother. Mother bear is aware of the threat. If she wants to bring up her cubs successfully during now and the next few months, she has to steer clear of the adult males. Although they first saw the light of day in a den just last winter, the little ones have to adopt a brisk pace in order to keep up with their mother. That all's clear. After hibernation, the male is simply interested in finding something to eat. The annual volume of precipitation here is around 2,000 millimeters, twice as much as in the UK, but even the most persistent rain moves on eventually. Bears never faced extinction in northern Spain and have evolved into a subspecies of their own, the Cantabrian brown bear. Around 140 of them currently live here, making them Western Europe's largest bear population. Nonetheless, poaching and incest remain a threat. This mother has but one cub with her, and as brown bears rarely rear solitary cubs, it's quite possible that a male bear has attacked and decimated the little family. As with all brown bears, they enjoy a mainly vegetarian diet. The mother prefers fresh oak leaves, while her youngster is more of a roots and tubers fan. It's amazing how the otherwise ponderous animals managed to wander around the steep terrain with such apparent ease. As with most single children, the bond between mother and child seems to be especially close. For the little one, his environment is full of wonder. At an age of just four months, 
he has more than enough time to discover the world around him. The intimate connection is not for all eternity. The mother will spend about two years together with her cub, then she will drive him away from her side in order to mate again. But until then, the little bear has a lot to learn. The rugged slopes of his home are quite a tough school to attend. The Cantabrian mountain range spreads from the Basque country in the east to Galicia in the west. The Picos de Europa National Park is doubtlessly one of Spain's most spectacular regions. Small mountain villages are embedded in this majestic landscape. Villages like Mogrovejo. Here, time appears to have stood still. Aquilino Campoyo Guerra is a mountain farmer in the Picos de Europa, as were generations before him. He uses traditional work methods to this day and is specialized in cattle farming. I became a farmer from the day I helped my father with the cows when I was a child. Before I took over the farm, I spent five years as a truck driver. My father retired and my brothers were not interested in farming, so I now run the business. I like being my own boss, even though it's hard work, but I don't have any specified hours to adhere to and I've liked cows ever since my childhood. For them, today is a very special day. For the first time this year, Aquilino sends them out into the fresh, lush meadows. At last, free of the confinement of the stalls and into nature. Aquilino should be satisfied. The sumptuous grass ensures larger milk yields so that the calves grow up healthily. An intact nature is essential for the mountain farmers who can then live from their cattle. Last winter saw many trees snap and die. A welcome chance to collect as much firewood as possible to prepare for the next cold season. You have to be as tough as leather if you call the mountains your home. No hustle and bustle here. Nature dictates the rhythm. And this means that humans have to be proactive. Unfortunately, in idyllic mountain regions such as this here, almost only the elderly remain, as the youth can find much better future prospects in the towns. Many villages lose their inhabitants. As a mountain farmer, Aquilino receives government grants. He will remain living here at the foot of the majestic peak of the Picos de Europa. The Cantabrian mountains are interspersed with an abundance of rivers and streams. The banks are full of life in spring. The Asturian fire salamander is the only one of its kind with a complete yellow coloring. Just like all of his relatives, he has an incredible appetite. And you can't beat a decent portion of worms. The earthworm thinks it's being really clever and soon understands the folly of his ways. The 
the fat snack should keep the salamander's battery going for a few days. This dipper had a lot less luck with his food search. Most of the streams of the Cantabrian mountains flow north. If the salamander would let himself get carried away, he would at some point arrive somewhere in the Atlantic. One of the particularities of the northern Spanish coastline are the so-called rias, narrow ocean bays that cut their way through to the interior. Memories of Scotland or Ireland abound, as Spain is so unexpectedly diverse. Even in their traditional music, one can make out the influence of the Celts. At the moment, very few international tourists care to visit Asturias' green coast. It's more the summer haunt of hot and bothered Spaniards from the heart of the country. Then Galicia, Spain's westernmost region. Here is also the notorious Costa da Morte, the coast of death. This is Pethaberos territory, home of the goose barnacle collectors. One of them is Francisco José Suto Barrero, but everyone calls him simply Paco. I've always been attracted to the sea, though not professionally. As a child, I often came here fishing with my father. We used to collect worms as a lure, but also goose barnacles. Maybe I made my choice back then. I've now been collecting goose barnacles for seven years. And this is arduous and very risky. Firmly attached to the rocks, they have to be detached by hand. Paco's workplace is the dangerous wave-whipped shoreline of the Atlantic. Even the slightest inattentiveness can be fatal. instincts are attuned to waves. Seven years in this profession have sharpened Paco's senses. He is always on guard. Only those that respect the rhythm of the seas can successfully brave the elements. But not everyone can. Sometimes tragic accidents occur, as these memorials on the Costa de Morte testify. I do get scared sometimes. I knew some people who died while working as goose barnacle collectors. Sometimes you just get into perilous situations. It all happens so quickly. You slip and smash your head on one of the rocks, or you underestimate the power of a wave and get taken out to sea by it. It's easy to get killed in this job. Paco is aware of the risks every day when he is out there, yet still he sees his profession more as a passion than a job. After work, the yield has to be examined and sorted. In order to keep stock stable, the collection of barnacles has to be strictly regulated. They may not have the appearance, but they actually belong to the family of crustaceans. Although not exactly pretty, they are classified as the most expensive delicacy of the Atlantic. In restaurants, gourmets spend horrendous sums for the bizarre seafood.
quiet days, the rugged cliffs merely allow us to imagine with what power the Atlantic shapes Spain's northern coastline. Just a few miles from the sea, the peaks of the Cantabrian mountain range seemingly reach for the sky. In the meantime, spring has also arrived in all its splendor in the higher regions. It can be seen and heard. Two blue throats are vociferously defending their territory. It ensures them food and habitat. Reasons enough to keep others at bay by singing. Mother Bear now finds vitamin-rich blossoms and grasses. Her offspring prefer basking in the warm sunshine. The work for the protection of the bears has until now ensured that the impressive animals can continue to wander around undisturbed. The immense diversity of the Cantabrian mountains flora is unique in the entirety of Western Europe. Columbine, daisies, The blue iris and countless orchids can be found in many areas. Butterflies are especially fond of this attractive food supply. The picos are a magnet for around 150 species. One of the largest and rarest of them is the mountain Apollo. His proboscis enables him to absorb the nectar of the thistle blossoms with ease. Without regular mowing, this colorful habitat would be lost. The flower meadows would turn into brushland. Spring is my favorite season. I can leave the cows in the meadow, there's less work to do, and the weather is nice. Aquilino has waited for quite some time to do the spring mowing. In the winter, he feeds the mown grass as valuable hay to the cows. Apart from a few small villages, the mountains of northern Spain are almost completely deserted. The best conditions for an unspoiled and species-rich nature. When night falls, light-shy creatures begin to stir. All senses sharpened and wide awake. The bank vole notices that something is afoot. It's best to go. No matter how elegant and silent the nocturnal genet may be, the bank vole was faster. The genet has only recently become a mother. Her offspring were born in a tree hollow about nine weeks ago, and the little ones are waiting to be suckled. Although they are already quite big, they still need their mother. The males have hardly anything to do with the rearing, While suckling one of her young, 
the mother devotes her time intensively to fur care, a sign that she is completely relaxed. One rarely gets to see a Janet. They lead a hidden life, protected by the cloak of night. To be able to provide her offspring with milk, the mother has to catch prey on a regular basis, which is why she is off again on the hunt. It will take about another week before the cubs can leave the protective den themselves. One can see by the way the female moves, Janets belong to the group of viverids. Patiently, she moves into position. Who knows? Perhaps she will manage to catch the bank vole by dawn. The coast of northern Spain is around two and a half thousand kilometers in length. Plenty of room for seabirds. Their day on the coast of Galicia begins with hectic hustle and bustle. There are around 16 types of seagull in Europe. Surprisingly, the Mediterranean gulls don't have their biggest Spanish breeding colony in the Mediterranean south, but here in the north. Most of their chicks have hatched, just recently too, as one can see by their fluffy down dress. As precocial birds, seagull youngsters can give you a run for your money as soon as they've hatched. As they are so advanced in their development, their energy demands are correspondingly high. The chicks have to be cared for, and it's time for the older birds to join the hunt. The birds keep a lookout for fish in groups. Gulls always know where they can find something edible. They can reach 30 years of age and more. Time enough in which to become an experienced fish catcher. As no predators pose a threat on the remote coastal rocks, they often leave their young behind. Before long, they begin to feel hungry. Eventually, the waiting comes to an end. Almost all gull species have a red mark at the end of their bill. Instinctively, the chicks rub against this to beg for something to eat. This in turn stimulates the older bird to regurgitate food, although this does not guarantee that all of the young will receive their share. The little ones are confused. Where's my share then? They have to be fed several times a day. Now at last, the snack bar is open. Not a single morsel will be wasted. The ocean provides them with sufficient nourishment, but first, it has to be found. Paco's profession requires physical exertion. It's not something for whips. But whether or not one can work like this until old age is questionable. The big goose barnacles fetch the best prices, and they can only be found on the islands off the coast. A close watch is being kept on his slow progress.
Nowadays, it's really hard to earn anything from collecting goose barnacles. I always make light of it by saying that I don't really live from my job, but rather from my wife's. It was a lot easier some three or four years ago, but today it's impossible to feed a family on it. For one, the prices have sunk considerably. With a farada, an iron shovel, Paco removes the sessile crustaceans from the rock. Then a quick peek into the next crevice, thereby carefully evading the next wave. Paco knows the rhythm. Collecting goose barnacles is definitely one of the most dangerous jobs on Earth. Mysterious shadows of powerful beings make their way through the vast expanse of the Atlantic. The scary basking shark is a giant of up to 10 meters in length the world's second largest fish, but he is fortunately harmless. With his barn door-sized mouth, he filters exclusively plankton out of the water. His name is derived from his elongated pupils, the cat shark. Compared with most of his relatives, he is more of a lightweight. Sharks have existed for more than 300 million years, long before dinosaurs walked the earth. They therefore belong to the most primordial species of fish living in the seven seas. Porpoises can be found on many of the coasts of the Atlantic. They belong to the most prevalent whales of the northern hemisphere. Related to dolphins and just two meters in length, they are also one of the smallest species of whale. But their curiosity belies their stature. Talking of stature, the sperm whale. He is at home in all oceans. With a length of up to 20 meters and a weight of around 50 tons, he is the biggest predator on Earth. He combined extremely large amounts of oxygen in his blood, enabling him to make do with one strong breath for up to two hours. Giant squids are often prey for sperm whales when they dive into greater depths. This relative of the squids is not large and doesn't live in great depths. A fin seam keeps the body exactly in position. The sepia is just around 50 centimeters long and likes to hang out in shallow coastal waters. They attach their eggs to the ground with their endogenous glue. This prevents the current from washing the eggs away and at the same time supplies them with large amounts of oxygen. The genitals of squids can be found between the tentacles. This makes it difficult to ascertain whether mating is affectionate or more of a fight. Rare insights into the underwater world of the Atlantic. The few people who decide to move to North Spain's coastal region usually have the same destination, Santiago de Compostela, the capital of Galicia.
The old, time-honored cathedral is the objective of all pilgrims that have wandered along the way of St. James. The joy at their arrival could be seen in their faces. The ultimate pilgrimage is nonetheless probably the most famous milestone. The zero-kilometer mark at Cabo Finisterre. In the old belief, it was considered to be the end of the world, as legend will have it. Not far away from the end of the world, Packer relaxes by doing a spot of weekend angling. To enjoy the ocean without getting wet, what luxury. Angling is a chance for him to keep in touch with the past. I was born in La Coruña, close by the sea. My father was an angler, but not professionally. We used to go angling a lot back then. When I was 19 and had to leave to go to university, yes, that was hard for me to live without the sea. The people on the coasts between Galicia and the Basque region have always lived with and from the sea. But that which makes Spain's north so unique is the direct clash of the Atlantic and high mountain ranges, the Picos de Europa. The highest peak in the national park stretches some 2,600 meters into the sky. Sailors returning home used to see the mountain peaks long before they saw the coastline. This is how they got their name, Picos de Europa, the pinnacles of Europe. Beyond the tree border, a completely different world begins, a world that appears barren and colorless but far from it. Difficult to find, but the search is worth it. Wall creepers add color to the gray monotony and are something quite special. Only slightly larger than sparrows, they have chosen the rough mountain world as their environment. Ornithologists from all over the world are enthused by their ruby-red plumage. The prey spectrum of the wall creepers comprises mainly insects that they look for in the rock face. With success. When the rocks warm up during the day, the insects that reside there become more active. The female knows only too well how to use her tweezers like Bill. Unnoticed, she's being watched closely from someone who appears to be very impatient. The female has cunning plans for the captured butterfly. For weeks now, most food was not meant for her, but for him. The hungry young bird flies to the food pickup. But nothing doing this time. The indignation is huge. The female wants to lure her offspring out of her territory to help him begin an independent life. This is upbringing war creeper style. The young bird is certain to find his own territory. It's hardly squalid around here. 
food is plentiful too. Parts of the mountain range were declared a protective reserve back in 1918, and the national park has been its present size since 1995. From the mountains of Asturias and Cantabria, we move on eastwards to the Basque Country. The permanent exchange of ebb and flow is especially strong on this coast. In some places, the tidal range can be as much as five meters. This is why, during the flow, water is pressed into the wetlands of the interior. A surprising animal species has settled there. Red deer live in the Basque country not only in forests, but also in the midst of reeds. These protect them from enemies and also provide nourishment. Autumn. While little egrets and white storks take rest here before flying on to their wintering areas in Africa, it's anything but peaceful back at the deer's place. The rutting season is in full swing. It's now all a case of respect and dominance between the bulls. The lower ranking animals are not interested in the disputes. Seems harmonious, but looks can deceive. There's excitement in the air. The animals incur surges of elation and testosterone levels increase. The bulls require patience when mating, as a doe is only able to conceive for a few hours per year. With a time frame this short, it's even more important that a bull demonstrates that he is nothing less than, excuse the phrase, top dog. gives way first, loses. But neither of them even considers this. Each of them has a body weight of 150 kilos. The bulls are evenly matched. Both of them deserve to pass on their genetic heritage. But only the most tenacious has a chance of finding the female's approval. Bitter confrontations such as these sap energy levels considerably. After ratting, the bulls will have lost 20% of their body weight. And in the end, the winner lets his competitor know who's boss. And the ladies, too. It's done. He has successfully passed on his genes. His competitor shattered. Fortunately, one of northern Spain's abundant rain showers cools down tempers. But the rutting season is not over yet. The next confrontation is just around the corner. Back to the Picos de Europa. In the autumn, 
the annual cattle market takes place, a very important event. Aquilino and the other mountain farmers present their cows, hope for a few good deals, and look forward to get-togethers with friends and colleagues. Those present, whether man or animal, accept the rainy weather with patience and composure. As it stands, Aquilino can still take care of his farm alone, but for how much longer? Who will then take over once his time has come? My sons are studying and will eventually graduate. Young people don't want to be farmers anymore. This is why my farm will just disappear, like so many others. In the meantime, most people in Mogravejo are now in retirement. Once they worked in agriculture, now they work in their gardens and play cards. But Aguilino is not even thinking of retirement. He wants to see many generations of calves come and go before he's ready. Nowhere in Spain is autumn quite as beautiful as it is in the Cantabrian mountains. It's time to prepare for the approaching winter. The rose hips have to be harvested quickly. Whilst trees reduce their metabolic processes and jettison their leaves, mushrooms literally shoot up out of the ground. For some, they are the last delicacies of the year. The odd nibble doesn't harm a mushroom, as long as the wind disperses its spores. Sea air draws across the land and severe weather conditions approach. The first snow of the year has already fallen in the mountains. The high mountain region is the kingdom of Cantabrian chamois. They represent a subspecies that one can only find here. The females live in a group together with their kids. The bucks usually go their own ways. But in November, other regulations apply, as then it's the mating season. The buck is completely focused on the females. But they observe a rather relaxed attitude. the buck remains on the ball. His hormone devils play havoc with his patients, but the ladies are not yet ready to mate. But one can only try. Well, that got off to a damp start. Resigned, the buck leaves the group alone. Time is now of the essence as winter is already in sight. Snow and ice define the climate in the mountains for the coming months. Hardly anything seems to move, but those who want to survive must now become active. The jay collects the last remaining morsels. The acorns that he doesn't immediately eat serve as a reserve for bad times. The jay has an incredible memory and is later able to find most of his hiding places. 
A clever lad. Whilst winter forges ahead, it claims its first victim. A group of ravens have discovered a perished wild boar. Hunger and cold had obviously weakened the animal beyond help. Ravens often search for carrion when food sources are scarce. Others also appear interested in the feast and observe the goings on keenly. The situation at the carcass appears calm, but trouble is not far away. Griffin vultures. The huge birds know that there is enough here for them up for grabs. They maintain their distance and stoically endure the jibes of the ravens, but they are hungry. The ravens slowly lose control. Time to depart. Soon, nothing will hold the vultures back anymore. remain in the background. They have already filled their bellies. Anyway, the snow provides a surface for the very best sliding experiences. Playfulness is a typical raven trait. But there's something that is much better than playing in the snow to snuggle up to one's partner. It's soon mating season for ravens. Just a few feet away, the Battle of the Buffet is still underway. Griffin vultures can easily weigh as much as eight kilos, and this with a wingspan of almost three meters. Reason enough not to mess with these guys. For the vultures, winter is like a well-stocked refrigerator, and there's always carrion around one can wrangle over. The cold season will soon be over. The winter thaw is underway. Slowly at first, then ever faster. Spring can no longer be constrained. And once again, nature gathers momentum. And so, another new generation makes its way, awkwardly at first, into a life full of wonder in Spain's north, the homeland of Aquilino and Paco. I'd never want to swap. I have my friends and my family here. I don't like towns at all. I like nature. The sea is an important part of my life. You look towards the horizon and simply lose yourself in it. Andalusia, the southernmost province of the Spanish mainland. 30,000 greater flamingos have gathered at the lagoon of Fuente de Piedra. Here is Spain's largest breeding colony and also one of the largest in Europe. 
with their specially shaped bills and exceptional technique, flamingos filter microcrustaceans out of the water. These tiny animals lend the flamingos their pink hue. Equipped with extremely long necks and legs, the greater flamingos are the largest representatives of their family. The elegant movements of the birds were the inspiration for a world-famous dance. The flamenco. Even their name was passed on. Flamenco is the Spanish word for flamingo. The old, time-honored towns of Andalusia are just as famous. The Alhambra in Granada, for example. And of course, Seville, with its imposing cathedral. Southern Spain is a wealth of cultural treasures but also has a unique nature at its disposal. Off the beaten track and far from the overcrowded beaches, there are unspoiled landscapes, like the Cabo de Gata, Andalusia's biggest nature reserve on the Mediterranean. The geology of the 82,000 acre large coastal region betrays its volcanic origin. The vegetation is sparse, but it's sufficient for the goats. At the Cabo de Gata, a paradise has remained, one that is becoming ever more seldom on the Andalusian Mediterranean coast. Here, nature dominates, not only at first sight, but on second sight, too. Hardly anyone gets to see a European chameleon face to face. The bizarre creatures are incredibly successful insect hunters. The tips of their tongues come equipped with a suction pad-like hollow they use this to strangle their prey, which sticks to them like glue. The European chameleon can poke his tongue out for more than half a meter. The locust hasn't the slightest chance. Chameleons have excellent eyesight and can move their eyes independently from one another. This enables them to determine the distance of their prey exactly. Their peculiar movements make them difficult to find for both enemies and their prey alike. The beetle disappears into his mouth within a fraction of a second. The hunting success doesn't remain unobserved. The chameleon is concerned. His body language shows. Chameleons are loners. Neighborliness is not their thing. The speckled animal has his territory here. The coloration signalizes stress. Resolved, it marches straight at the intruder. When territories overlap, it can lead to border conflicts. then to end up in a dead end of your own making. A messy situation, obviously unpleasant for both. 
No one is interested in a serious dispute, and eventually, the big cheese goes on his way. There's room enough for everyone, after all. And prey, too. To the northwest of Andalusia, on the border to Portugal, is the Estremadura. The province, with its more than 41,000 square kilometers, is roughly the same size as Switzerland, yet is one of the most sparsely populated regions in Europe. This is something the Hupo really appreciates. In many other countries, he has become rare, but in the Estremadura, one can hear his distinctive call everywhere. He searches for food industrially. The permanently hungry offspring is waiting for the next delivery. Their menu comprises insects in all thinkable variations. A big, fat mouthful but by no means enough. The hoopoe is roughly the size of a thrush, but due to its feather bonnet and long beak, it seems much bigger. The beak enables him to pick and poke for prey to his heart's content, but sometimes it can take quite a while for this to be successful. Meanwhile, the chicks have to be fed every 20 minutes. The old bird knows how to take care of his duties with composure. The young have developed well and will soon leave the nest. Then, at last, the strenuous hard graft will be over and done with. What at first sight looks like a plantation are in actual fact several home oak forests, otherwise known as dehesa. They are characteristic of the Estremadura. In the spring, the storks begin to take possession of their nests. There is often the odd quarrel, but for the most part, everything is quite harmonious, as the joint clattering proves. Whereas many storks from other parts of Europe merely spend the winter in the Estremadura, thousands of couples remain the whole year round and breed in huge colonies. Storks lead a serial monogamous marriage. This means that the partners come together to brood together annually. This increases the chance of bringing up their offspring successfully. Around 30 days after breeding, the young begin to hatch. They remain in the nest for about two months, where they are taken care of by the parents. Until they are ready to fly, they will have quadrupled their weight. The Extremadura is deemed the wild west of Spain. One has to be a tough dude to live here. Frugality and composure are the most important qualities in this region. Manuel Gomez Romero, or Manolo for short, 
has got some important business to deal with. He has to feed his chickens and take care of the finger. But as laid back as possible, the Estremadura doesn't do stress. Manolo is self-sufficient on his little farm. This enables him a satisfying and free life. What I like about my work is that I can look after the animals, go to the finca in the morning, experience the sunrise, and to work on my land. The wealth of animals here is fantastic. I really love it. I have two sows and several piglets for private use. I don't need more pigs than that. Not far away, bee-eaters have returned from their African wintering regions. They have a long and tiresome flight behind them. On arrival, the migratory birds begin their search for a suitable breeding place, with steep, sandy escarpments topping their list of preferred residences. Only thing missing is an equally suitable partner. There's more than enough to eat including all kinds of insects that bee-eaters catch in flight. The hard chitin shell is inedible and is quickly spat out. The birds search for new partners every year, and every year the males have to convince the females that they are the right choice. It has to work this time. The most promising bridal gift amongst bee-eaters is, of course, a bee. But first of all, the poison sting is removed. Things are very courteous and respectful between bee eaters. The male is fortunate. She has decided he is the one. They will pair up several times in order to consolidate their bond. A short while later, the female will lay her eggs in an earth tube. The seemingly tropical birds breed in almost the entire South European region. When their offspring have fledged, they return to Africa again via the Mediterranean. The coast along the Andalusian Cabo de Gata cannot be used for farming purposes. This is why the inhabitants turn to the sea. Like Victor Manuel Zordo Bueno, he came to the coast, bought his own boat, and took up life as a fisherman. I came to the Cabo de Gata because the landscape here is unique. I fell in love with the area straight away. I simply feel attracted to the sea. I just wanted to spend one summer here, and now I've been here for 11 years. To make a living from fishing is no mean feat, especially when one only has such a tiny boat. I think our way of fishing is sustainable, and this is not just our opinion. People from the EU, from Brussels, paid us a visit and said that this way of catching fish is exemplary. So different from industrial fishery, which has nothing at all to do with sustainability. But in the end, it's like it is in the sea. The big fish eat the little ones. Victor's catch today was hardly worth the trouble. While many regions of the Mediterranean have been overfished, life pulsates in the protected areas. A 
barracudas, the walls of the ocean. The predatory fish hunt in all depths of water. Every smaller species of fish keeps well out of their way. Nowadays, there are more than 20 marine protective zones in the Spanish regions of the Mediterranean that comprise some 8,000 square kilometers. The wealth of colors and shapes is formidable. The cleaner shrimp is looking for food with determination. In the next best mouth of a moray eel, the tiny crustacean eats morsels of food from between the teeth of the ferocious hunter and as a reward is not eaten himself. Hermit crabs and sea anemones have a deal too. The one offers mobility, the other protection. In the seahorse world, it's the men that fall pregnant. They carry and fertilize the eggs that the female previously deposited in the male's brood pouch. A huge sea bass. These fish only reach ages and sizes like this in protected zones. A cuttlefish glides by. everything under control. The octopus has exceptionally good sight. When danger lurks, he retreats into a crevice. Sea slugs outdo one another with the most garish of outfits. This fellow here is also a slug named Sea Hare. Aliens could hardly look any more bizarre and fascinating as many of the creatures in the oceans of our planet. the elegant blue shark draws its course, Victor returns to the harbor. Total catch limits are only imposed on a few Mediterranean species. The industrial use of trawl nets has to be drastically reduced. Victor will hardly become rich with his method of fishing, but does help maintain the natural balance of the sea. Back in the harbor, Victor has a lot to do, but he always finds time for a quick chat. Me gusta de ser pescador que que trabajo con gente que es noble. As a fisherman, I have a lot of honest people around me. I like that. You get nothing for nothing. It's a hard life, but I'm proud to be a fisherman. And this can only improve the more sustainable catching fish in the Mediterranean becomes. At sunset, with a great deal of luck, when the air is especially clear, one can experience the legendary green lights. A magical moment. Away from the coast, southern Spain reveals its typical face. Old olive groves. Sunkist Andalusia is one of Europe's greatest olive producers. To protect them from the heat, the houses have all been whitewashed. In the summer, temperatures can be as high as 45 degrees in the shade. The further one gets in the interior, the more barren it becomes, but also all the more spectacular. A 
only the locals know the desert-like canyons of Gorafe that belong to the driest regions in Europe. Although the snow-capped peaks of the Sierra Nevada are within view, the landscape tells the true story. This place is a real furnace. Here, death is permanently on the lookout. Senses have to be sharpened. Carelessness can be very costly. The praying mantis is more than used to the extreme conditions. She is not alone. There is, after all, the age-old law, eat or be eaten. But who eats who? OK, the question has been answered. The scorpion's poison could have killed the mantis, but in this jewel in the desert, she pulled the trigger first. When the sun goes down, the temperatures sink slightly. But one can hardly speak of it being cool, even at night. Under cover of darkness, a very special hunter becomes active. Equipped with sharpened senses and extremely good climbing abilities, To be able to navigate so skillfully through the branches of the trees, she needs excellent eyesight and pronounced tactile perception. All of this can be attributed to the genet. Her long tail helps her balance. She is about the same weight as a domestic cat, but much longer. The genet originally comes from North Africa. One assumes that she was brought to the Iberian Peninsula by the Moors during the Middle Ages. She has been part of Spain's fauna ever since. A very successful part, too. The animals are loners. Their food spectrum is varied. They also eat birds, small mammals and reptiles. This allows the genet to switch his prey at will. This flexibility is possibly the recipe for success for their distribution from Arabia to Africa. In Europe, they can only be found on the Iberian Peninsula and some areas of France. Individual genets have been spotted as far away as in Germany, but one assumes that these animals were abandoned there. Before midsummer arrives in the Estremadura, she presents herself in all her color and glory. The dehiza seems to glow. Dense areas of lavender and poppies cover the landscape. Those looking for the old and original Spain can discover it here. As yet, practically unknown by tourists, and with little or no industry, just pure 
unadulterated nature. Manolo is on his way to work. His old bicycle has definitely seen better days, but still does its job as reliably as ever. Every few days, he goes to see how his sheep have been keeping. They can, in fact, be left alone for longer periods at a time. But the odd control is the better bet. Is the herd still complete? Are there any sick or injured animals? I have around 400 sheep. For the most part, we sell the lambs. We don't make any cheese. But when I shear the sheep, then I do sell their wool. Sheep rearing is widespread in the savanna like Dehesa. Fortunately, the Extremadura is big enough so that there is also plenty of room for the wild inhabitants. These fox cubs are around five weeks old. They were born here in their foxhole beneath a holm oak and have only just begun to venture outside these past few days. Apprehensive and curious at the same time, they begin to explore their immediate environment. To be able to survive on their own, they still have a lot to learn. Eventually, though, uncertainty will soon become experience. Their mother often goes hunting. Thank heavens for siblings. Scuffles are important for the cubs. They help strengthen their muscles and motor functions and establish their rank order. But above all, they are a lot of fun. When mother comes home, she is the one and only star. The cubs cannot yet consume solid foods and are therefore suckled by the vixen for another two or three weeks. When the cubs were younger, the female stayed with them the whole time and the male provided her with food. He has now moved on, leaving the mother to fend for herself and her offspring. Until the little ones are able to look after themselves independently and search for their own territory. The real dimensions of the Estremadura can only be seen fully from a bird's eye view. Griffin vultures fly effortlessly through the air. Their enormous wingspan makes them excellent gliders. They know how to use airstreams and thermals perfectly. Spain is the vulture country in Europe. Nowhere else do so many species breed, and nowhere else are there as many as there are here. Vulture protection in Spain plays an exemplary role for other countries. The blistering sun could be dangerous for the youngsters, but fortunately, the huge wings also double very nicely as solar sails. At feeding time, the old bird regurgitates food out of its goiter. Vultures exist almost exclusively on carrion. They do not attack living animals. Griffin vultures breed on steep cliffs. 
There they erect their nests made of a few loose branches on rock ledges. Not until the young birds reach the age of around four and a half months will they attempt to leave for the first time. With such widespread sheep and goat breeding in Spain, it's hardly surprising that the odd animal dies every so often. This doesn't go unnoticed for long. Black kites are among the first to reach the carcass. An Egyptian vulture, Europe's rarest and smallest species of vulture, observes the hustle and bustle. Although black kites also actively hunt for prey, they won't say no to a bit of tasty carrion. The Egyptian vulture couldn't agree more. The offspring of the griffin vultures is still begging for food. And he is not the only one. The flying giants have been following events down below and now demand their share. Panic breaks out. The situation escalates. More and more vultures begin to circle over the scene. They are planning a hostile takeover. The kites are unable to defend their precious against the overpowering defense. And the wild dancing begins. They can only watch in despair. Some beaks of the vultures have done an excellent job. Within the shortest space of time, there is hardly anything left of the carcass. Normally, table manners in the Estremadura are somewhat more civilized. Manolo is preparing the food for his family, including finest Iberian ham from his own production. In the Estremadura, making cold meats like chorizo and, of course, ham, really good ham, is traditional. Manolo prepares migas de pan over an open fire, a dish consisting of bread and vegetables typical country fair. His oldest son is busy repairing the tractor. The hydraulics have been causing problems. Here in the country, one takes care of things like this alone. Most inhabitants of the Estremadura live on smaller farms. Manolo's finca is already more than 200 years old. Traditions and family cohesion are very important to him. Well fed and satisfied, it's back to the dehisa. Stress at Manolo's is almost unthinkable. Los Barruecos is an El Dorado for bird lovers. 
Storks have also discovered its qualities as a breeding place. Their nests are amongst the largest in the animal kingdom. Some of them have been in use for centuries and can weigh as much as a ton. Now, in the summer, the young birds are around seven weeks old and busy practically forcing their parents into food bankruptcy. But soon, they are old enough to leave the nest. More storks breed in Spain than in almost all other European countries. It is estimated that there are more than 30,000 pairs. And instead of flying to Africa, many of them simply spend winter here under the Iberian sun. Not only humans feel attracted to the villages and towns of Andalusia, the lesser kestrel is also a fan. They breed here in small colonies on old buildings. They build their nests for their impatient and hungry offspring between the roof shingles. Locusts are big favorites with the kids. Quarrels can hardly be prevented in such cramped living conditions. As insects constitute the major part of their diet, lesser kestrels react extremely to the use of pesticides in farming. The number of lesser kestrels is in drastic decline. Just 5% from the global count of the 1950s remain. This makes the protection of nesting places like these all the more important. Timing is of the essence for lesser kestrels. They start with their brood exactly when the most food is readily available for their offspring. A persistent sparrow patrols the roof shingles. By now, the kestrels must have become used to him. But most feel uneasy in the vicinity of the passerine bird. He is under critical observation. The sparrow is a pure granivore. So what is he looking for? Some feathers to upholster a nest, possibly? Hard to say. Whatever it is, he's causing a big stir. At last, the little nuisance buzzes off. A big, fat, juicy locust is just the job when it comes to calming nerves. And not just one. There are many more of those that have to be caught. Spain's rich fauna is outstanding in Europe, and that is because nature protection has become extremely popular in the past few decades. People have realized that nature is one of the country's most important resources. In the autumn, the time will have arrived for Manolo to release his pigs from the pen. In the coming weeks, they will spend a lot of time in the dehesa because the home oaks are then full of acorns and pigs love nothing better. Manolo then gladly offers a helping hand. Ample acorns and plenty of movement in the fresh air. This is how the ham of the Iberian pigs develops its very special aroma. The jamón iberico is a prize-winning delicacy. 
and of course, one that always graces Manolo's table. This type of pig farming has been practiced in the Estremadura for centuries and is an important reason behind the existence of the Dehesa. The open home oak forests are man-made cultural landscape. The trees have to be cut back regularly to ensure a rich acorn harvest. This requires a lot of experience. The open countryside and its careful use are the reasons behind the enormous biodiversity in the Dehesa. As a pleasant side effect, they also secure Manolo's firewood requirements. The fact is, cooking and heating with oak wood is widespread in the more rural regions of the Estremadura. Central heating plays a very small role in a country that is so spoiled by sunshine. In the Sierra Nevada, the highest mountain range on the Spanish mainland, autumn is well underway. It is the kingdom of the Iberian ibex. They are now tucking into the very last grasses and herbs of the year. The first snow on the peaks signals harder times to come. The mighty horns of the bucks are very impressive. They also come in handy for a good old-fashioned scratch. It's mating season, and the male's interest in females is slowly gathering speed. The competitors firmly focus their reciprocal control on one another. The rutting season is not as simple as it seems. The bucks analyze the female's specific odor molecules. This indicates to the male whether the female is already fertile. Tenacity is paramount. Patience is a virtue, but some of the males just give it a go regardless. with rotten results. To propagate one's kind, the bucks need to learn a little more about diplomacy. The rutting season is still in full swing, but the animals sense that change is in the air. In the winter, the Sierra Nevada becomes Spain's cold chamber. Meanwhile, the animals have descended to the lower lying regions because as of a height of around three and a half thousand meters, nature succumbs to a wall of snow and ice. But in Andalusia, winter is but a short intermezzo. By the end of January, the almond trees are once again in full bloom. The first insects begin to stir, and on high, above the white villages of the Sierra Nevada, snow begins to melt on the mountain peaks. At last, spring returns, and a new generation 
sees the light of day. Here in the south of Spain, one of Europe's most varied regions, and as far as Manolo and Victor are concerned, their homeland is definitely a very special place. I especially like the landscape, the wealth of animals and the oak forests in the Estremadura. I wouldn't want to swap any of this for any city, the little villages and the environment. I simply love it. I could never work in an office. I love being outside in the fresh air. I would feel like a bird in a cage. 